Claro. Good morning. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to Mia Foley, 
Fulbright Scholar at the Universidad Carlos III in Madrid. Neil Foley is a professor and Robert H. and Nancy Dedman Chair in History. He's also the Associate Director of the Clement Center for Southwest Studies at Southern Methodist University. His current research centers on a variety of topics, including politics of immigration and citizenship in North America and Europe, nativism, xenophobia, and ethno-nationalist ethno movements globally, changing constructions of race, citizenship, and transnational identity in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, migration studies, and comparative civil rights politics of African, Asian, and Latin Americans. He is co-editor of Understanding Global Migration and the author of The White Scourge, Mexicans, Blacks, and Poor Whites in Texican Cotton Culture, Quest for Equality, The Failed Promise of Black, Brown Solidarity, Mexicans in the Making of America, Los Mexicanos en la Creación de los Estados Unidos, Teaching Mexican-American History, and he also co-authored Reflexiones, New Directions in Mexican-American Studies. Professor Foley is a distinguished lecturer of the Organization of American Historians and has lectured extensive, extensively in the United States, Europe, and Latin America. For a number of years, he has lived and taught in Mexico, Japan, Germany, and Spain. He also spent two years living on aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean Sea, where he taught sailors of the U.S. Navy's Sixth Fleet in the Program for Afloat College Education. Thank you, Neil. Uh, thank you very much um, for that introduction. Um, so I may as well begin by thanking the Commission, uh, Comisión Fulbright España, for supporting my sabbatical leave at uh, La Universidad de Carlos III in Madrid. And thanks to the Franklin Institute and the City College of New York, the Instituto Cervantes in Nuevo York, uh, for hosting this seventh annual Congreso. And to all of you for being here and to those who are responsible for having organized um, this exciting conference. I've really enjoyed what I've seen so far. So my talk is called, as you can see, Whose History, Monuments, Memory, and the Contested Past of the West and the South. Um, it has a lot to do with um, uh, not relations between North America and Spain, so much as it has to do with the uh, second half of the talk with the legacy of Spain in the United States, which is ongoing. I mean, it's not gonna ever go away in my opinion. Just like the legacy of slavery in the South is an ongoing controversy. So what I was trying to do here is to put those two together um, because I've been thinking about how uh, when we take our children uh, or our parents or friends and we go touring other countries and we're looking at all these monuments and all the monuments I've seen in Madrid, I have no idea who these people are. I have to keep looking at my phone and, and looking them up. But they tell us who we are as a nation, as a people, as, a, as the Germans would say, as a folk. And so they're important to understand what different regions of my country, the United States, decides what kinds of monuments in, um, should be put up. These are usually local choices, right? They're not federal choices, except for one, and we'll get to that in my talk. So public reckonings with monuments and memorials in the West and the South reveal um, how narratives of conquest and colonialism in the West and slavery Jim Crow in the South are made of historical silences, how, and how African Americans, Native peoples, and others have sought to change those narratives, and what that tells us about the current growth of white nationalism in the US. So the controversy over Confederate monuments in the South has received much attention in recent years, and for good reasons. Um, slavery, and the conquest of native peoples, after all, are the founding sins, if we can call them that, of the nation. And white supremacy is its enduring legacy. So scholars of the West acknowledge the region's history of slavery, just as scholars of the South acknowledge the history of conquest, right? The two are interrelated in both regions. 
Uh, but the monuments and memorials of these regional heritages and the controversies that surround them tend to be grounded in the history of slavery and the Civil War in the case of the South and conquest and colonialism dating back over 300 years in what is now the American West. In other words, kind of like the second Reconquista, right? First the one against the Moors, or los Moros, as they often say, and then the new world of um, turning um, native peoples into Christians. What is at stake, basically, is whose history and whose heritage define these distinctive regions to say nothing of how these controversies might inflect, contradict, or reinforce the national narrative of American exceptionalism and its insistence that we are one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. It's a pretty simplified version of American exceptionalism, um, but it's a pretty simple and simple-minded concept. In this talk, I will compare the Confederate statues controversy with little publicized um, uh, with the little publicized controversy surrounding monuments of Spanish conquistadors and missions in the American West, particularly in California, New Mexico, and Texas, to show how monuments reflect the way communities create narratives to suit contemporary political and cultural sensibilities. I'd like to begin with a quote from an anthropologist uh, I don't know if my French is up to this, but it, I th think it sounds like Michel Rolf Trouillet, who ended his book, Silencing the Past, Power and the Production of History, which was written over two decades ago, with this admonishment. We know that narratives are made of silences, not all of which are deliberate or even perceptible. But, me, but we may want to keep in mind that while some of us debate what history is or was, others take it into their own hands. Like what happened in Charlottesville, Virginia on August 17, 2017. You could say they took history in their own hands almost five years ago when they rallied around the statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee chanting, you will not replace us, blood and soil, and white lives matter. Blood and soil, as most of you know, is a refrain from the Nazi era, uh, Blut und Boden, um, which was, of course, at its heart, an anti-Semitic uh, slogan. We know what the consequences of that slogan was. You will not replace us has gotten a lot of press, not only in Europe, but in the United States, because it comes from a pamphlet published um, over a decade ago by a Frenchman named Renaud Camus uh, called Le Grand Replacement, The Great Replacement, which of course is all about um, French people being replaced by Musulmanes, or in the United States, uh, white people being replaced by the combined uh, peoples of color, Native Americans, Latinos, African Americans, Asian Americans, right? Because their numbers are going so dramatically fast, not just because of immigration, um, which has slowed considerably, particularly from Mexico, uh, but to uh, birth uh, fertility rates, birth rates. That demonstration uh, resulted in the death of Heather Heyer. You can see that picture on the right-hand side um, a neo-Nazi who had been posting on Facebook about his views, his hatred of black people, got in his car and drove it directly into the counter-protesters and killed Heather Hare. She was a 30-ish woman, young woman, paralegal, and a civil rights activist. Uh, the person who committed this crime um, was tried, and I think he's serving a life sentence. Many white nationalists in the South say they are defending the Southern heritage, a heritage which includes going to war to defend the institution of slavery and the enduring belief in the supremacy of the white race over African Americans. That much has not changed. The African American author James Baldwin wrote many decades ago that the Southerner remembers historically and in his own psyche a kind of Garden of Eden in which he loved black people and they loved him. 
Historically, he went on to say, the flaming sword laid across this Eden is the Civil War. He wrote that in Esquire magazine in 1960. No doubt nostalgia for the South of Edenic innocence played a part in the memorialization of Confederate martyrs and the myth of the lost cause. But most historians today, almost all of them agree, that the dedication of hundreds of Confederate statues across the South from 1900 to 1920, talking about almost a half a century after the Civil War, and the naming of schools after Confederate generals and other political icons of the, of the antebellum South in the 1920s to the 1950s represented an effort that began towards the end of the 19th century to create a more acceptable version of the Civil War and, its, and the region's past. First, these Southerners sought to minimize the centrality of slavery as the principal foundation upon which the Confederate States of America went to war against the nation. Second, these Southerners reaffirmed the supremacy of the white race and to exercise political and economic control over African Americans in those 11 states after emancipation and the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the so-called Reconstruction Amendments that gave citizenship and citizenship rights to former enslaved peoples. This is a timeline of monument building, and I know you can't read it. it I just wanted you to have a visual to see the peaks. Um, the Southern Poverty Law Center, which many of you may be familiar with, uh, which is uh, sort of an overarching civil rights, human rights organization that uh, looks at what's going on in the United States. They've identified 1,747 Confederate monuments, place names, and other symbols still in public spaces today, both in the South and across the nation. These include 780 monuments, more than 300 of which are in Georgia, Virginia, or North Carolina. 103 public K through 12 schools and three colleges named for Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, or other Confederate icons. 80 counties and cities named for Confederates, nine observed state holidays in five states, and 10 US military bases. Since the massacre of nine African Americans in 2015 at the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, which I know many of you read about, scanned seven years ago. More than 100 monuments and other symbols of the Confederacy have been removed because of the murderer who said, we need to end the lives of black people in this country. We can begin to appreciate the centrality of Confederate statues nationally in defining the meaning of American democracy and the ideals that they embody by taking a short tour. Now, I'm taking you to the US Capitol. If you ever visit the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C., you can't miss the collection of statues on display at the nation's Hall of Statuary Fame, officially known as the National Statuary Hall Collection. I went to high school two blocks from the U.S. Capitol on Michigan Avenue to a Jesuit high school. And uh, the first time I went into that uh, statuary, I just was not at all aware that I was looking at a hundred white men <laughs> who happened to have military uniforms on or coats and ties because they were politicians. It didn't occur to me that, I'm afraid and ashamed to say, but it was a long time ago, <laughs> that there were no women in that statuary and no people of color. The concept of a national statuary originated in the middle of the 19th century and And the, propose, the proposal for a statuary became law in 1862 when Congress authorized the president to invite each state of the Union, there weren't 50 at the time, but however many there were, I don't remember, to provide uh, and furnish statues in marble or bronze not exceeding two in number for each state of deceased persons who have been citizens thereof and illustrious for their historic renown. I like that, illustrious for their historic renown, or for distinguished civic or military services 
such as each state may deem to be worthy of this national commem commem commemoration. So in less florid prose, basically, we know you all have heroes. So step up, get a sculpture, sculptor, sculpted statue, full, full body, full length. We're going to put that on a pedestal in the Capitol. So who are your heroes? And of course, the 11 states of the Confederacy came up with heroes who fought against this, the Union to separate from the Union and to defend the institution of slavery. Today, of the 100 statues, 91 are white men, mostly soldiers and politicians. Nine states chose to represent women. And two states, Nevada and North Dakota, as you can see highlighted there, chose to send to the US Capitol statues of Native American women, Native women's. Nevada sent Sarah Winnemucca, a Paiute Indian, who is known for pursuing friendly relations with the arriving Anglo-American settlers. We know the end of that story, don't we? Sakakawea is a Shoshone. She was a 24-year-old young woman when she helped Lewis and Clark as a guide to explore Louisiana. So that counts as a place on a pedestal for those two states. One of them, Mother Joseph, I think I have a picture of her here. There she is. In 1856, Mother Joseph led a group of five missionaries to the Pacific Northwest Territory, Spanish missionary friars, right, and Anglo-American uh, missionaries, to help establish 11 hospitals, seven academies, five Indian schools, and two orphanages. Of course, this was long before the old history of Indian schools came to light and just about how brutal, in fact, people went to Indian schools and didn't come out of them, many of them, okay? That's been written about extensively in the last 20 or 30 years. Here's a fact that may startle you or may not. Not a single African-American is represented among the 100 statues. In 160 years since the law was passed in 1862 to create the statuary, to 2022, to this day, there is not a single statue of an African American from a single state of the United States of America. Does that tell you something about memory and memorialization of who we are as a nation or not? The first was a bust of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. added in 1986. Now remember, I may say this a couple of times, but the states have the only, have, are the only ones that have the prerogative of deciding who goes into the, court, uh, into the statuary. So the United States Congress, which is the executive branch, said, wow, this is really not cool. I mean, what message does this send to the rest of the world? All right. So they decided to have a bust which didn't get added to the, the coral area, the statu, uh, 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 statuary, uh, but was put in the welcoming center, okay? So that we'd have a black person in the Capitol, the image of a black person at least, that statue of a black person, a bust of a black person. Congress didn't create any additional statues of African Americans until the Obama administration, when in 2009 another bust this one of Sojourner Truth was added to the statuary in the visitor center, kind of like the Zoom waiting room, you know, waiting to get into the statuary someday. This next slide shows you that there are three times more Confederate statues than African-American busts in the Capitol building. What, one, uh, what I call monumental inequality. Confederate soldiers and politicians, on the other hand, have been part of the Statuary Hall collection for over 100 years, including Robert E. Lee, president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, um, I'm sorry, not uh, 
Robert E. Lee, the general of the Army of the South, and, Robert, and Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, along with his vice president, Alexander Hamilton Stevens, which most Americans don't know about, um, probably for good reasons, he declared in his famous 1861 cornerstone speech in Savannah, Georgia, beginning of the war, the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. So it was pretty clear in the South up until the 60s of the 20th century that these were words you could speak nationally or regionally. There were, this was no coding, this was just facts. Black people are inferior. Five days after the white nationalist march in Charlottesville five years ago, Nancy Pelosi, current Speaker of the House, she wasn't back then, called for the removal of all Confederate statues in the halls of Congress. This is how she said it. On the floor of the House, she said, the Confederate statues in the halls of Congress have always been reprehensible. The halls of Congress are the very heart of our democracy. The statues in it should embody our highest ideals as Americans, expressing who we are and who we aspire to be as a nation. I don't think most people would disagree with that. So, what do those statues tell you about the aspirations of certain regions of our country? An African-American representative in the House of Representatives, Cedric Richmond, Democrat of Louisiana, and chairman of the Congressional Black Congress, put it more bluntly. He said, we will never solve America's race problem if we continue to honor traitors who fought against the United States in order to keep African-Americans in chains. People of color like AOC in the House of Representatives, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, have a way of just speaking bluntly about things uh, without uh, wrapping them up in the you know, niceties of democracy and all of that. Um, that's we all know is true, but sometimes you just have to say it straight up. The only states can decide to keep or remove or replace the statues of peoples that over the years they've, they've chosen to commemorate, some of them stay there for a very, very long time, and then new heroes arise, and they think, well, who are we going to take down? Because they have two, right? Which one are we going to take down and put up another one? So that's always an interesting thing to watch because it tells us something about who we are. This is the United States Capitol. This is not the State House in Austin, Texas. Um, so, so far only one state has voted to remove a Confederate general from the US Congress, from the Capitol building. And that was by a woman named Debbie Wasserman Schultz. She's a Democrat from Florida. Uh, and in 2016, she urged the legislature of her state to replace the statue of a Confederal General Edmund Kirby Smith, who stood in the Capitol building. I had never heard of this person. A lot of these people, you know, generals are a dime a dozen in the Civil War, right? You know, it's like we know who Robert E. Lee is, and the rest don't matter. You know, you see statues of them all over the South, and you go, who are these people? Well, they're, you know, they were wonderful people to the people who decided in their communities. And it's usually um, people like General Edmund Kirby Smith um, are from the neighborhood, right? And so uh, the, the communities put them up as uh, someone that they think deserves a place in the Capitol. State lawmakers agreed to remove the statue. Um, but they didn't know who to replace him with. They decided they wanted to remove the statue, the statue because of his um, uncoded statements about black inferiority. North Carolina also recently voted to replace the statue of Charles Brantley Icock, who was a governor, not a general, who governed the state of North Carolina from 1901 to 1905. Some 35 years after the end of the Civil War. And the reason they decided that he had to go is because it was becoming well known uh, by historians and others that he gave a speech in 1903 where he explained his views on race. And this is what he said. Let the Negro learn once and for all. There is an unending separation of the races and that they cannot intermingle. 
But there flows in my veins the blood of that race that has conquered the earth and seeks to lead to the dominance of the Caucasian race. When the Negro recognizes this fact, we shall have peace and goodwill between the races, because there hadn't been a whole lot of that from 1865 to 1901 when he was governor. African Americans had a habit of constantly pushing to have their constitutional rights. Um, they were restored by the Reconstruction Amendments, they just were not practiced or enacted by the southern states. So they replaced the white supremacist governor, Icock, with another white man, this time a statue of Billy Graham, a Southern Baptist evangelist, very popular in the 50s, 60s, 70s, all the way up to Ronald Reagan in the 80s. Everybody knows Billy Graham. I'd love to be in a room where they're debating who can we replace this avowedly racist governor for saying what we all think, but you know we got to get him, we got to take him down now because of all the snowflakes out there who are all upset about you know uh, Civil War generals and politicians. And then they come up with uh, Billy Graham. It strikes me as interesting that you can't come up with a woman hero. You know, I have three daughters, so I'm trained to think this way. <laughs> so. Um, I'm forced to say these things. Now, I believe these things, and it's like you can't be unaware of, of this part of American history. And so, um, many people, and I'm thinking mostly of uh, some historians, actually, uh, not many, a couple, uh, that I can't even find more than one or two, have argued that removing Confederate monuments uh, is tantamount to erasing history, and I know you've all heard that argument. It's tantamount to erasing history. I don't, believe, I don't believe in slavery. I don't hate black people. I just think it's wrong to take these statues down because it's part of our history and we need to talk about it. Well, I agree with that. I definitely think we should talk about it. But um, apparently 15 state legislatures in the United States were passed laws against teaching CRT, critical race theory. So I actually, if I really paid attention to that law, cared about it, I could even be giving this talk uh, without going to jail or something. But um, you know, so, so I've always wondered about that. Why do they say it erases history? And the reason I wonder about it is because I lived in Germany for five years, and I'll throw out a pitch to the Fulbright Commission, because uh, one of those years, I was a Fulbright professor of American studies at Humboldt University in Berlin. And Germany, as you know, so I lived there for five years. So I kind of really got to know how the Germans thought about World War II. And I'm sure you've read a lot about it. Um, and so you know that Germany destroyed all the monuments and statues, memorials and plaques honoring Hitler and Nazism after the war. Not right after the war, it took a while, you know, but they, they removed them all. Now, did destroying those monuments erase the history of Hitler and the Third Reich? No way. There's not a German today, and I'm talking about a person who's born and raised in Germany who's from Iran, right? Who's just second generation German, or from any other of these countries now where you can get German citizenship, birthright citizenship, which was, you were not able to do before the year 2000. They all know about the Third Reich. They're not. Um, some people think they don't carry the burden of guilt because they came from Iran, but there was an interview in one of Michael Moore's um, documentaries uh, calling, I think it was called, um, uh, Who Are We Going to Invade Next? And I thought it was going to be about the military doing something awful, invading Latin America. It was about um, education in, in Sweden and Norway and other countries where you have free education and so forth. And he interviewed some people in Germany in the schools there. It was a high school. Uh, it was in Berlin, I believe. And um, he asked a dark-skinned person, uh, uh, he said, uh, Michael Moore being a white man, and with that perspective, he said, um, well, wh where are you from? He said, Berlin. But you know how that question goes when you don't want to look like you belong. And, he, and he's dark, moreno, moreno. And he, he says, uh, he said, no, I mean, where are your parents from? So he's, he knows that, that line of questioning. He says, 
Well, my parents uh, immigrated here from, from Iran or Iraq. I can't remember, and I know there's a big difference between the two, but, but they do have Iranians and Iraqi in Germany. And, um, and Michael Moore said to him, well, your, your people had nothing to do with Nazism in the Third Reich. I mean, so, and this kid, he's like 16 years old, he said, he was puzzled and he said, I'm a German. Of course, you know, um, I think what happened was horrible. And it's our responsibility to, to talk about that. He was basically insisting on his nationality as a civic member of a nation, which he had citizenship to, right? And therefore could not opt out. Like some people say, well, I didn't have anything to do with the genocide of the Indian, so I, you know, my ancestors weren't slaveholders and slave and slavers, so you've all heard that argument, right? And so, so I'm thinking about all these things as I was doing the research for this, and I was thinking, you know, you know the removal of those German statues and icons to the Third Reich and National Socialism is not an effort to erase the history of Nazism, but rather to acknowledge the horrors of Nazism and construct different monuments as a reflection of their current values today. So what might one of those values be? How many of you have seen this in Berlin? Denkmal für die ermordeten Juden Europas. Okay. Memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. I don't just love the way the Germans just are going to say what it is. Not, you know... This was uh, the victims of World War II. No, the murdered Jews of Europe. And look at the size of that thing. Do you know what building that is in the back over the tree line? That's the Reichstag. You cannot walk around Berlin and not see this huge city block memorial to the murdered Jews. And that's not the only thing you're going to see if you walk around Berlin. You know, the, I forget what they call them, the the Steppenstone, Steppensteine, that have the names of individual Jews who were victims of the Shoah or the Holocaust. In place of Nazi monuments, these are the kind of monuments and memorials the Germans put up. That's not erasing history. That's acknowledging it and saying we're not those things anymore. But we're not going to pretend as if they didn't happen either. The U.S., by contrast, has no memorials whatsoever to the genocide of the Indians, to the crime of slavery, and half a century of lynchings of African Americans in the, so in the South in the aftermath of slavery, human rights abuses that go back a long way um, that don't even get acknowledged. In fact, the United States opened up a museum in Washington, D.C. that is almost a must to go see, even though it's very, very heartrending, and it's the Holocaust Museum. And to me, it serves an interesting political purpose. You want to see evil? Look to Germany. Don't look at yourselves. Don't think about genocide of the natives. Don't think about slavery. Think about those Germans, right? And uh, we've been pretty successful at keeping things under wraps. So my point is that the removal of monuments, whether of Hitler or the Third Reich, or Confederate generals, though the Confederacy doesn't erase history, but it does tell us something about what historical narratives we do want to tell, us about, tell about ourselves and the ideals we want our monuments and memorials to represent. And so I've made my point. I want to turn now to the controversies on the Western Front, New Mexico, Texas, and California, as they struggle with their own version of Confederate tributes, that is to say, celebrations of the Spanish conquest and statues of conquistadors, uh, conquistadores y missionaries and settlers. And so I'll start with one from San Francisco. This is the early days statue um, that was dedicated in 1894 and up until recently stood in San Francisco, downtown. Um, Controversies over messaging of these statues that you're about to see have not received as much media attention, actually 
far less media attention than removal of Confederate statues. Um, African Americans are not invisible in our country. Uh, their history may be, you know, uh, toyed with and, 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 and tried to be kept um, on the down low. But Indians really have been silenced. I mean, they really, their history has really been silenced. And so um, these memorials uh, add not just to the silence of what um, uh, Indian lives and li life was like before uh, colonialism, um, but basically depicts things like this. What is the message of that particular image? I mean, I'm not like an art historian or someone who's like trained in visual culture, but it, it seemed to me that this statue might have been offensive to, was offensive, had to have been offensive to the native peoples. Um, Elena Ortiz, a tribal member of the Okeowingue Pueblo tribe in northern New Mexico, acknowledged that native activist groups had been emboldened by the removal of Confederate monuments across the United States. So it's kind of like Chicano movement taking a page out of the African American Civil Rights Movement, right? It's not like these things sort of didn't talk to each other at some level. So this monument depicts a vanquished Indian. I think you'll agree that's a vanquished Indian. Lying at the feet of a settler with his hat on, looking sort of distracted in the past. There's two hands going up. One, the one by the, behind the hat is his hand, and then the other one is the, the friar's hand, I think. I'm not sure. I can't see that far. Um, and then there's a Franciscan missionary, sort of in the foreground there, bent over the Indian. And um, frankly, when I saw that, it looked scary to me. It look, he looks like a cross between Charles Dickens' The Ghost of Christmas Yet to Come. <laughs> and a Dementor from the Harry Potter movies, <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking it's probably unintentional, but I mean, if the natives wanted to make a statue of a missionary, that would be like convey the message of exactly how much they did not want to be around those kind of people. Not surprisingly, many Native American groups viewed the statue as a reminder of forced conversion and the violent dispossession of Native lands by Spanish and later American, Anglo-American settlers. A Pitt River tribal member from this region named Morningstar Gali called the sculpture a monument to genocide and scoffed at assertions that its removal would show disrespect to history. The final decision to remove the statue by the city's Board of Appeals was in large part a response to the public outcry following the Charlottesville March of white nationalists. So you can see it sort of bled into uh, sort of the West saying, well, we've got our issues here. Why don't we do something about it and not wait for something like, you know, Char uh, um, um, the Charlottesville March. A few months earlier, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors had vo voted to rename Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day to honor the Native Americans. And you can imagine that has not gone down well in the United States because aside from all the other issues that divide red America from blue America, left from right, and the polarization we're all probably tired of hearing about. Um, then it has to also be, you know, um, about not celebrating Thanksgiving because of what it means to some many people, and not celebrating Columbus Day because of what it means to many people. So, and these are mostly younger people, I have to tell you. These are the folks who think about those things because you know, it's not like they haven't been taught that in the schools. There have been generations. The millennials have been teaching in schools for a long time and people before that. So Gen Zers don't come up to my university not knowing what's up. I mean, I'm not teaching them anything new by anything that I'm talking about now. It's, this is what I do for public audiences, right? Um, to get them to engage in some of these issues and ideas about why we put up the monuments we do and what we want to memorialize and remember about ourselves and the things that we don't want to remember about ourselves, that we want to silence. Because then we're going to turn to the next one, which is Junipero Serra. And I'm sure you all know about him. Um, he was a missionary very active in territorial uh, Span Spanish colonial California. Um, and um, 
at a Santa Barbara mission in California recently, native activists decapitated the statue, that's on the left side there, uh, and poured red paint on it. Um, and this was an 18th century Franciscan friar who was canonized a saint in 2015, seven years ago, by Pope Francis for his efforts to Christianize California Indians. The Indians were appalled that uh, many of them who were Catholics, right, uh, and mixed with Latino blood, mostly Mexican, you know. Um, uh, and so that split the community over this issue. Uh, to, to refresh your memory, Sarah came to California in 1768 to convert the natives, and in 1770 founded Carmel Mission, the second of California's 21 missions. Some natives said he should have been called the saint of genocide. While the majority of Catholic Hispanics, many of them of mixed native ancestry, supported the canonization, of the Spanish friar. We're gonna see this later, um, how in New Mexico, the Hispanos who claim to be of Spanish ancestry and the native people have been mixing for a long time and, and those who are still leaning to, towards their Hispanic or Hispano identity um, really wanna celebrate, you know, um, conquistadors and everything else and then the Indians are saying, no dude, that's not, that's not a good thing. Um, and so that, that tension still exists in, in Taos. I go there every year uh, to teach a course uh, right off, off the Taos Reservation, Taos Pueblo. I don't think they call it a reservation. During a trip to Bolivia in 2015, Pope Francis told the people, I humbly ask forgiveness not only for the offense of the church herself, but also for crimes committed against the native peoples during the so-called conquest of America. So you have the Pope saying, I'm sorry, but we're gonna canonize this dude anyway. And to, to put um, a finer point on it, uh, bestowing sainthood on Sarah opened a decades old wound between Catholic Church and Native Americans in California who contend that Father Sarah forced Native peoples to abandon their tribal culture and convert to Christianity and that he had many whipped, imprisoned, and sometimes worked or tortured to death, a history that we all are familiar with. Archbishop Salvatore Cordeleone of San Francisco acknowledged the whippings and coercive conversions but defended the church's mission, enterprise, and the new world. He said, European powers are going to discover this continent and settle here. Were indigenous people better off with the missionaries or without them? I would say they were better off with the missionaries. So you can see how we're coming down on different sides of this issue. Um, over how to interpret, you know, was colonization and conquest a good thing or a bad thing, right? Well, from the Spanish point of view, it was not a bad thing. From the indigenous point of view, is, hey, I'm sorry, this is not like what we wanted and what we asked for. We didn't have much choice in the matter. I'm oversimplifying things, but I think you get what I'm trying to say. Um, so for many California natives, Junipero Serra stands in for power dynamics inherent in the logics of settler colonialism that have endured for centuries of native disenfranchisement, dispossession, and cultural repression. So now I'm going to turn to another place, California. Ca uh, uh, same state, but different place. In 2015, the California Senate passed a resolution to remove the statue of Father Junipero Serra from the U.S. Capitol because he's one of the statues in the, coral, in the statuary at the U.S. Capitol and decided that it should be replaced. And they replaced it with NASA astronaut Sally Ride who is the first American woman in space. And aside from those uh, women that you saw in the previous slide, those nine women, um, one of the few women that now are going to be in the, cap, uh, in the Capitol. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of press about this, but Sally Ride was also the first known gay person in the National Statuary Hall collection. And now we'll turn to New Mexico. New Mexico controversy recently erupted over the inclusion of the Festival of Santa Fe, which goes back 100 years. They've been doing that for a long time. And the reenactment of the Spanish reconquest of New Mexico in 1692, known as the Entrada. Billed as the oldest continuous community celebration in the United States, the festival reenacts Don Diego de Vargas' so called bloodless reconquest of the city in 1692 after the Pueblo Revolt 12 years earlier. 
that have killed 400 Spaniards and forced some 2,000 Spanish settlers out of the territory where they um, headed south along the Rio Grande to El Paso, across the river, and hung out there until it was safe to return. So you all know the story of the Pueblo Revolt. This is Pope, the Tiwa Pueblo Indian, organized, uh, who organized the many Pueblo tribes and led the full-scale revolt in which almost all the Pueblos participated. So while protests have occurred practically every year at the festival, in 1977, the state's 19 Indian Pueblos boycotted the fiesta after Indian vendors were told not to appear at the event. If you've ever been to Santa Fe, I mean, Santa Fe wouldn't be Santa Fe without Indian vendors. I mean, they're selling all of their art, their, their pottery, their jewelry, everything. And they said, no, we don't want you to be here for the celebration of the Entrada. I guess that was a Spanish thing and had nothing to do with the Indians. I don't know. Um, it's hard to understand sometimes how a city council can make kinds of rulings like that. Councilor Carmichael Domingos, Santa Fe councilor who was who has himself played the role of Diego de Vargas on the horse, you know, the, um, in the Entrada, said, quote, there's been a demonstration in some form or fashion at the fiesta for many years. In 2000, he said, a line of Native Americans stood in front of the stage during the Entrada. They just stood there. They didn't say anything, no speeches. And so uh, Dominguez says, they stood there, and he said, that's pretty overwhelming, even intimidating. So here's a slide of a native person standing there by himself in front of the entrada as a protest against what was happening. So in 2015, in response to the ongoing protest, Mayor Javier Gonzalez, who also played the role of Diego de Vargas, it was always you know, some local Hispanic who got to play Diego de Vargas, right on the horse with his lance and pretend to be the leader of the reconquest, the bloodless reconquest. He agreed that it was time to end the reenactment, that part of the festival, to end the reenactment of the Entrada. And here's how he said it. As proud as I was to participate in this important community tradition, I do believe it's time that we be truthful about the actual events that occurred during the resettlement. That force was still used to resettle Santa Fe, and the indigenous people were forced to adopt Christianity as their religion. To imply something other sends the wrong message that the Spaniards were welcomed. Um, if you've ever been to Santa Fe, or if you've been to New Mexico, you'll know that it's the land of enchantment and everything is peachy keen and the sky in Santa Fe is beautiful and so is it in Taos. And, but it hasn't always been that way. There's been a lot of conflict between the Anglos and the natives and the Hispanos, Hispanic populations. Um, um, that, much is, that much is part of the past history. Now the issues that separate them are over water rights, and it's all being dealt with by lawyers in the courts and so forth. It's a different kind of, of conflict. It's a little below the, the radar of the usual media. Um, and so the end came for the Vargas Entrada, but not the end for some of the ways in which the people who participated in the festival saw themselves. So this is um, Caballeros de Vargas. It's like a society, or, or uh, what's the word in Spanish? Uh, 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 yeah, cofradía, yeah, cofradía uh, of, of, of uh, Caballeros de Vargas, right? So they're Hispanos. And they carry the Virgen La Conquistadora. Um, and then the sort of the... Mexican, mestizo, indio, they carry this Virgen Morena, as we know as the Virgen de Guadalupe. And the, the Virgen Conquistadora, I've seen other pictures that don't call her La Virgen de Conquistadora, they call her uh, the Spanish virgin, virgin, virgin that is called La Virgen de los Remedios. Now, I had never, I still don't understand what that's supposed to mean. I mean, the Virgin of Remedy, but then you've got, you know, all kinds of different things that I don't understand about these names. But um, um, uh, the thing I want to call your attention to is um, that there's, you know, 
that the division in this society in northern Spain is a cultural one, but it's also about, you know, the indigenous people and, and a lot of the sort of the, the Mexican uh, mestizo people do not feel comfortable walking around with a white virgin. They want their Virgen de Guadalupe. And if you ever go to Mexico, you're not going to see, you know, you know, the Virgen Conquistadora. I and mean, you're not going to find a whole lot of statues to, you know, Hernan Cortez either. Um, so that's pretty obvious. But it's interesting to me that uh, even in the United States, if you go to the homes of a lot of Mexican Americans, um, I don't know, maybe recently, but for the whole time I was growing up, you go to a Mexican American home, you almost be guaranteed of two things. You're going to see, uh, you know, um, religious iconography. You're going to see a Virgen de Guadalupe statue or picture or something with uh, palm leaves uh, wrapped in crucifix. Yeah. And then you're going to see a portrait of JFK, right? So it's <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's kind of one that has been fading a little bit because that's a, such a long ago time. But it always struck me as odd that, you know, that was always part of the way the interiors of uh, Mexican American homes look, including our, my own. Um, So the turn away from the celebration of Spanish conquest cannot sit well with many Hispanos who trace their ancestry to the original Spanish settlers, including Oñate, right? So the city historian, Ana Pacheco, who traces her family tree back to Diego de Vargas, said the Fiesta Council should include some kind of an educational aspect about the bad treatment of the Indians, but said it's unfair that Spaniards take the brunt of the blame for the wrongs of the past. It pisses me off, she said. It's always the Spaniards. They're so bad, they're so bad. Is, any is anyone trying to get Andrew Jackson off the $20 bill? Which is a good point, you have to admit. Um, so there were a number of quotes I could give you on the Hispanos just saying, you know, that happened a long time ago, get over it, you know, things like that. And then the Indians saying, well, it's kind of hard to get over what happened. Uh, I love this quote. You're doing away with those traditions, this is an Hispanic person, and we'll just become like Phoenix, Arizona. No hay nada, no espíritu, no spirit. So if you've ever been to Phoenix, Arizona, you can tell that northern New Mexicans are not, you know, people who would appreciate that kind of uh, place. No hay nada, no hay espíritu. After 400 years of mestizaje, Spanish-Indian intermixing, virtually all Hispanos and uh, natives are descendants of Spanish and indigenous peoples. One Chicano um, said after the um, entrada was uh, banned uh, uh, from future festivals, we need ceremonies and commemorations that acknowledge the complexity of our, her of our history as both colonized and colonizers, as both being native and European descent. Um, so New Mexico, put this statue in the corollary. 1997, the New Mexico legislature selected Pope as the subject of the state's second statue for the National Statuary Hall of Collections. Does anybody know who the first statue was? Well, you know it was a man. Coronado? Hmm? Coronado? No. no, no, it was um, Dennis Chavez. They waited a long time because he didn't become senator until the 1930s. Um, so I don't know why they, I mean, you didn't have to like put two and you could just take your time and think about it. So it's the only one that I know of, the only state in the union where both statues are not white men, right? Um, so, but then if you look at the demographics of the state, whites have been a minority in that state since time, since the Anglos, the Spanish arrived, okay? Um, and then I would be remiss if I didn't include the missing foot of Juan de Oñate in northern New Mexico. And I want you to know, it took me a half an hour to figure out on PowerPoint how to get that red arrow to, <laughs> to point to the missing foot. Because you just look at that, it doesn't mean much. But here's this guy. He's actually measuring how big that foot is that's missing. And you can get an idea of the bota on the other side, right? So he's saying, this whole thing was sawed off, OK? After four, so um, 
In 1598, to give you a little backstory, two sentences, the conquistador Juan de Oñate led his soldiers and missionary friars to northern New Mexico a decade before the founding of Santa Fe in 1608. There were at the time approximately 40,000 Pueblo Indians in that area and inhabiting the region when Acoma, the Acoma Pueblo Indians resisted, Oñate put the revolt down in a bloody battle, enslaved hundreds of the survivors and sentenced the men 25 years or older to have their, to their right foot cut off. Exactly 400 years later, in 1998, natives in northern New Mexico returned the favor. As New Mexicans were about to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the first Spanish settlement in the American West, an Indian commando group under the cover of darkness approached the bronze statue of the first conquistador, Don Juan de Oñate, and severed his right foot. They left the commandos left a message at the statue that said, we took the liberty of removing Oñate's right foot on behalf of our brothers and sisters of Acoma Pueblo. We see no glory in celebrating Oñate's fourth centennial, and we do not want our faces rubbed in it. And you can read about this in the New York Times. I mean, this was like, you know, front page news because it was just so like, wow. That is amazing. Who knew that there are people who are still thinking about, it's kind of gonna feel like if you go to Serbia, they'll talk about battles that they fought like in the 12th century, right? Well, if you go to Northern New Mexico, you know, 1680 is alive and well. I mean, people will tell you all about the Pueblo Revolt, right? And um, um, at the Oñate Monument and Visitor Centers after this happened, Esteban Arrellano, the director who supervised the reattachment of the new foot to the 12 foot stall tattoo, he complained this way, give me a break. It was 400 years ago. It's okay to hold a grudge, but for 400 years? I'm just giving the quotes, okay? For Native Americans, however, it's less about grudges than it is about how New Mexicans, particularly Hispanos, choose to memorialize the conquistador whose reputation for cruelty was so well known and documented that the Spanish king later punished Oñate for his excesses, excesses and banished him from New Mexico after he was tried and convicted of cruelty. So, so this is the guy you, because he what? He's a conquistador and you don't care that he was a murderer, a mass murderer? And this is my favorite of all. A few years before the, you know, this is the Oñate thing, right? The controversy. This uh, El Paso city officials had approved the commissioning of a statue of Juan de Oñate on a horse at the El Paso International Airport. If you ever go to the El Paso Airport, you're gonna see that statue. But in 2003, after continued opposition to the project by native peoples of, of uh, uh, New Mexico and El Paso, which is in Texas, but really culturally looks north, um, they decided that this is probably not something we should do. It's probably gonna have its foot cut off. It's, you know, things are gonna happen to this bronze statue. So this 36 foot tall, look at the person at the, behind the tail there to give you an idea of how big this thing is. This 34,000 pound statue, the largest bronze equestrian statue in the world was renamed simply the Equestrian leaving El Paso with a giant, unofficial statue of an anonymous guy on a horse. <laughs> and last but not least, I would be super remiss if I did not mention the Alamo. Perhaps the monument most guilty of historical silences where natives are concerned is located in Texas, and I'm referring, of course, to the Alamo, originally a Franciscan mission called San Antonio de Valero, Established in 1720 to missionize the native Coaltitecans and other tribes who lived in the region for a millennium. But the history of those native peoples was erased by white men and women in San Antonio in the late 19th century, about the same time that white southerners began their Confederate monument building craze, okay, the end of the 19th century. A native intertribal council estimates that more than a thousand mission Native Americans are buried in grounds adjacent to the Alamo. There's been a lot written about that, including in the newspapers in San Antonio and, and elsewhere in the United States. But the Alamo narrative does not include native peoples, despite the fact that according to the 2010 census, San Antonio was the city with the 10th largest population of Native Americans. Also, Anglo silenced the history of Tejanos, or Texas Mexicans, including those who died in the Alamo to defend the Mexican Federalist Constitution of 1824. Okay, this was not a movement for independence. This was a movement to 
opposed the centralist government that ended up being led by Santa Ana. They remade the mission into a shrine to the martyrdom of courageous white pioneers against the despotism of Mexico and its dark-skinned mixed-race people. The Alamo narrative also erases completely the role of slavery in the Anglo struggle for independence from Mexico, which had banned slavery. And even, it even silences the voice of Stephen Austin, the founder of the first Anglo colony in Texas under Mexican rule, when he wrote in 1833, I have been averse to the principle of slavery in Texas, but I have now changed my views. Texas must be slave country. Anglo settlers like Jim Bowie, Davy Crockett, William Travis, you know, the triumvirate of heroes that the Alamo celebrates, crossed the border between Louisiana and Mexican Texas without documents. Thus, the Alamo also is a shrine to Anglo illegal aliens. 25 years later, Texas voted to secede from the Union in 1861 to preserve slavery. Each of the seceding states had its secession document. And you can look them up online, they're fascinating to read. The secession document declaring why Texas is seceding from the Union is called the Declaration of Causes, ellipsis marks because it goes on and on and on, that impelled the state of Texas to secede from the Federal Union. It demanded the protection of, quote, the beneficent and patriarchal system of African slavery and the servitude of the African to the white race. Okay, so that's why they were going to war against the Union. So all this talk about states' rights, states' rights, like uh, it's another way of not talking about slavery. The racial fears and anxieties of whites in the South and the West intensified in the closing decades of the 19th century. And verse 2 of the 20th over the threat to white supremacy and to white women. It's no coincidence that the films Birth of a Nation and Martyrs of the Alamo, both released in 1915, portray African Americans and ethnic Mexicans as rapists of white women. So the growth of white male nationalism in Texas and the South was as much about the threat to their masculinity as their racial power and privilege. Today, non-Hispanic whites are less than 50% of the total Texas population, while Latinos are 40%. Latinos also represent 52% of all public school students in the state. And nationally, non-whites are a minority in all public schools, not in all individual public schools, but um, uh, in K through 12 as a, as a, as a, as a whole. So demography may, may not be destiny, but it does matter what monuments and memorials are being celebrated, by whom, where, and for what. Perhaps what's so troubling for white nationalists today, such as the march in Charlottesville in 2017, owes less to historical fears and anxieties over blacks and Jews and Irish Catholics and Italians you know, at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, but in the last 15 years to Mexicans and Muslims, but rather to the idea that they are being demogra demographically replaced, you know, the great replacement theory that keeps getting batted around in the US and in France and elsewhere. The idea has been around for a while, at least since the 1980s, when demographers began making predictions about the tipping point when the census began to predict that by mid-century, 21st century, whites will be less than 50% of the total population for the first time in the nation's history a decline of over 35% since 1960 when whites were 85% of the population. Here's what Time Magazine said, right? Um, what will the U.S. be like when, in 1990 uh, when whites are no longer a majority? And back in 1990, there were not a whole lot of people who were thinking about the 21st century, 2022, where this is actually happening. They were like, oh, come on. What is this? America's changing colors. What is all that about? And the last sentence of that article was, the browning of America will alter everything from politics and education to industry, values and culture, and it is irreversibly the America to come. I mean, that truer words were never spoken. It's irreversibly the world of America to come. And not only the United States, think of all these other cultures where um, European cultures, practically all of them, where the 
birth rate for whites is going down and, um, uh, or think of Asia, right? China, Japan, right? Uh, so these are, these are issues that uh, are much more in, in the media these days than it was in the 1990s when people were not really thinking about it. Here's, here's what Newsweek did three years later. You can say the image basically speaks for itself. A Newsweek poll said that 60% of Americans say immigration is bad for our country, which is something that all of you study North America and Spain. You all know that the United States is a nation of immigrants, but we don't tend to like immigrants, we, but we like to say we're a nation of immigrants. Um, uh, and then we get used to them, and then it's like, okay, let's move on to the next scapegoated group, right? Um, more, most recently, it's Muslims, right? And we don't even have that many Muslims in the United States. You know, this is not France. You know, we, less, what about 1% of the population of that? It's Muslim in the U.S., okay? Um, and finally, in the last few decades, beginning with Alien Nation in 1995, um, the U.S. has witnessed the proliferation of best-selling books adown, denouncing immigrants for causing the end of what Harvard, Harvard political scientist Samuel Huntington called America's core Anglo-Protestant culture and the white Christian civilization it represents. Now this was not you know, some right-wing talk host on Fox News. This was, I mean, there are people in this room who know Samuel Huntington is. I mean, he's a very well-known political scientist from Harvard. He wrote the book, The Clash of, the, of Civilizations, and uh, uh, Who Are We?, which was the screed against uh, uh, Latinos uh, taking over America. And uh, you know, he, he, he very much consciously writes for a public audience, right? Um, and he was 84 years old, and I, and I kept thinking to myself, America's core Anglo-Saxon values, I wonder if the guy's ever left Harvard Yard. Has he ever been to Los Angeles? Has he ever been to, I mean, you know, you're not gonna go around saying people, even white people don't say, yeah, I'm a representative of core Anglo-Saxon values. Core, that, that comes back from the 50s, which was his era, actually, where people still use the word WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, which means, you know, that's why we don't like Irish, because they're white, they're not Anglo-Saxon, Celtic, whatever. And they're not Protestant, they're Catholic, so no. So, um, so I, I give you a sampling of books here, right? I don't know if you can read, um, I, I, I didn't write it in my notes what it says on those things, hold on. I got, I got it right here. Adios America by Ann Coulter, and I know you know who she is. The left's plan to turn the country into a third war hellhole. Third world hell. Patrick Buchanan ran for the Republican nomination for presidency twice. Very for, sort of a, a Trump uh, prototype back in the, in the uh, early 90s, I think. How dying population, the, the death of the West, high dying, dying populations and immigrant invasions imperil our country and civilization. And then this new person, Lauren Southern, barbarians, how baby boomers, immigrants, and Islam screwed my generation. This is a millennial, right? who's not happy with their boomers, uh, who are responsible for letting in all these immigrants and, and Muslim, uh, Muslims. And then Tom Tancredo, who um, ran for the Republican nomination for president as well. He was a congressman from, a representative from Colorado. He wrote a book after he didn't become the nominee, Mortal Danger, The Battle for America, Border and Security, US, America's Border and Security. So for him, the, the threat is from Mexico and Central. Uh, was it Central America at that time? And the last one is Samuel Hunting. Huntington, who are we? The challenges to America's national identity. If you were honest, he wouldn't have said the challenges to American national identity. He would have said the threat to America's national identity. Because if he thinks America's national identity is core Anglo-Saxon values, then he is absolutely right. You know, because immigrants adapt and adopt the culture of America, right? There are not a whole lot of immigrants that I know or descendants of immigrants that I know who aren't as fond of, you know, hamburgers and french fries and all the, and the rap music and all the cultural aspects of being an American. If you grow up there, it's kind of like that Star Trek episode, uh, uh, Star Trek Next Generation about the Borg. You know, they come to whole galaxies and they say, we, we will assimilate you and resistance is futile. Well, I kind of think, like, if you come to the United States, and you have babies here, and they're going to grow up here, resistance is futile, mom and dad. You know, if you have, like, you want your children to marry a nice Catholic in, a Mexican girl or an Indian girl or, you know, from a Chinese girl or, or boy, it's like, 
maybe, maybe not, because you know they're not from those sending countries. They've assimilated sort of America's, uh, you know. If you, I mean, if you ever had sleepovers, my kids had sleepovers, and I was like, it just dawned on me that not, there was not a single white person in their sleepovers. They were Asian Americans from India, or from or from Pakistan, or from uh, from Japan, and and from all kinds of countries from Latin America and the Middle East, and now, not that they were excluded, it's just that the, the, the actual schools they were going to were, were so diverse that that was like the norm, not like when I was growing up when 80% of the United States was white. Um, you know, that's a, that's a different demographic, and it's all been happening, as all of you know, since the 1965 um, Immigration Act. And I'll stop with that, and thank you for being a patient listener. Uh, for my Okay, and now we have some time for questions, if you'd like. Yes. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil. Can you hear me? Destin, can you hear me? Okay. Neil, thank you so much. That was just expansive and just spot on in so many ways. Um, and very close to home, being somebody who, um, you know, who has roots in New Mexico and um, uh, his thought about some of these issues in my own family. Uh, I have a photograph um, that, that I actually published in a book of my uncle, uh, Joe Nieto, who is um, on a horseback portraying Coronado in the, the festival, the fiestas of Bernalillo, New Mexico. Um, and, um, it's, it's a source of, of, of both pride and shame in a way in my family because uh, at the time it was definitely a source of pride to have family involved in this, uh, this uh, commemoration of the history of the founding of Bernalillo which dates back to 1539 um, and, um, and our family roots and all that. Um, but uh, it occurs to me that those who wish to uh, remove, remove the statues, um, it, it seems to me that the discussion has t two, two effects. And I'm not one of those who says, don't remove them at all because it's like erasing history. Uh, but I, it seems to me that removal alone um, shouldn't end there. Removal to where? To do what? And then besides removal, how do, we, how do we sustain a conversation, a reflection about the ills of the past, rather than simply the removing out of sight, out of mind of the depredations, and then also the fact that we have to own that history ourselves, that many of us, I, many friends and colleagues, we have indigenous roots as well as European roots, and many wrap themselves much more in their indigenous roots. Um, but it seems to me we, that doing something with those statues to compel a reflection or creating new spaces, including statues of indigenous uh, uh, rebellion and, and resistance to, to empire. You know, um, you put your finger on a really difficult subject. I get asked uh, fairly frequently, not so much in the last couple of years, but when all this controversy was happening, they, this is how I got started to think about this. this, is not right up my research alley, but it was like, you know, you take a break and do research in other directions. And I was thinking about a lot of the questions and the things you're just talking about here, you know, I mean, you know, we're talking about, in your case, northern New Mexico, that is, uh, in other parts of New Mexico, that, you know, has different cultural aspects that are shared. I mean, there's intermarriage, there's all kinds of things going on, and so when the thing gets politicized, you know, families are like, wait a second, there's some arguments, and there are things going on here. So here's, I didn't read to you my conclusion, but it really is not much of a conclusion, it's certainly not a reprisal of what I wrote, but it really reflects what happened. Um, the first thing I would say is it'd be great if just one state of the United States of America would make the decision to put a black person 
that would start a conversation why only one state has one statue and 49 states and 99 other statues are not white, are not black, okay? That's one way to start from the top up, okay? Top down, I should say. Um, so I've often wondered what guidance a person like me as an historian who pay, gets paid to think about these things um, uh, might provide communities who are wrestling with these questions, like your community in Bernalillo and other, many other places in the United States, uh, who are having to reassess their regional heritage um, and the narratives of the past that they've created, right, the, as a result of these monuments that have been around for maybe long past their expiration date, but maybe not. So they say, so what, what would you recommend, Professor Foley? And I say, well, I don't have any advice to give you, frankly, um, in terms of guidance to offer beyond what history tells me. But I do know that if communities want to build bridges instead of moats, they must see consensus first on what values and ideals they want their communities to represent, and second, to consider whether these monuments embody those values and ideals that they wish to pass on to their children, which is putting it right back in your hands. You figure it out. What values do you want your children to have by the statues and the things that you're going to do, all right? The names of your school. Textbooks. Textbooks. Look, I'll give you an, a quick example of this. So the 1950s and 1970s was the era of changing school names to Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, stuff like that. So I was, on, I was asked to give a talk to the parents and the teachers who were having a hard time because being you know, liberal whites in Dallas, I, that there is such a community like that in Dallas. And they thought Stonewall Jackson, that's, uh, that's not the values we want our kids to. So, so OK, so what are we going to call the school? We just call it Stonewall. No, come on, that's, that's a cop out. Or let's just call it Jackson Highway. And then it was a blue ribbon school. So it was one of these things where they were really, the teachers were proud they were teaching in an exemplary school, right? It was mm -hmm. all of this. Well, five years earlier, my daughters are telling me, in their late 20s, early 30s, saying, um, how come you sent us to Robert E. Lee Public Elementary School in Austin? <laughs> and I said, you know, you never. It's like, maybe, will they, when they turn 40, will they stop doing this to me? But you know, it's like, um, because I wasn't thinking about that. It's kinda, I grew up with seeing that all over the place. And it sounded like an excuse, and they nailed me on that. They just said, you know, there were some activist parents um, who got in touch with some of the alumni of this public school, who graduated when they were, you know, out of whatever that sixth grade or seventh grade, sixth grade, five, fifth grade, sixth grade. And they grew up and said, yeah, why do, how come the parents never said, how come we never said? And so basically they, they organized and had these panels where they would come up to the school and talk about why they want to get rid of the name Robert E. Lee, because most of them did. They just didn't know what to replace it. It was kind of like taking down a statue, but that, now what do we do? That's when the conversation begins, right? Mm -hmm. Right, so, okay, do we all agree? No, there's some people who don't want to change the name. Robert E. Lee is great, you know, it's our Southern heritage. Like, okay, but those, those, those people don't exist in, you know, liberal communities. They exist in other sort of deep South uh, pride and heritage of the South, Confederate flag waving people. That's not Austin, Texas, for any of you who've been there. That's not even most of Dallas or all of Dallas or Austin or San Antonio or Houston. It's mostly a rural phenomenon, to be honest with you. Um, so what they did was they said, we have two options. This is to cut the story short. The first African-American woman that my children had in first grade was still alive. She was like 86 years old. And they say, why don't we name the school after her? That represents our values, right? I mean, you know, she's the first African-American to be hired in the 60s or 70s even at this school, long after Brown v. Board, right? That was just about school segregation. And so there was a lot of parental, including our family, was all behind that particular option. There was another option um, that a lot of the teachers and other parents wanted, which was to keep the name, because we never said my kid goes to Robert E. Lee. You know that. It's like, uh, where do your kids go to school? Oh, they go to Stonewall, or they go to Lee. That's the way you talk about it. So those people wanted to keep Lee, but get rid of the Robert E. part. And the, so we countered back that, 
wait a second, that's a cop-out uh, because we all know that, you know, why, why is it called Lee then? What is the reason it's called Lee? Because you decided to drop off the name of uh, the first and name and middle initial of Confederate. So you know what they did? They did research. Okay, so they came up with, and I knew who this person was because his archives is at UT, Russell E. Lee, who was a, who was a 1930s well-known photographer of the, of the Depression. He went around during the Depression era under the, what is it, the WAPC? Yeah, the, whatever. The Work Project Administration, and took pictures of all of migrant farm workers and toothless white people in East Texas who had overalls and were picking cotton in the 1930s already. And, and um, so he's well known to people who, who historians mostly who use their pictures and photographs to, for their books. And they said, we're going to say we're acknowledging the photographic uh, work of Robert E. of Russell Lee. And that one won. But to me, it's like, you're the community. We are the community. We discussed it. My side, our side lost. I think we lost a huge opportunity to do something really, really interesting. Uh, instead, we did this Lee thing, Russell Lee, and frankly speaking, nobody cares about who Russell Lee is. He was just doing his job as a photographer, right? He's not, he's not the kind of person you want to put in the, coral, or the statue, statuary and, um, you know, he's just a guy, but it was, a, it was their way of preserving the name Lee. And so there's a lot of that. They did that with the Stonewall Jackson School in Dallas. They asked me to give them opinions on that, too. And I said, look, you know, it's your issue. I mean, if, you, if Joe Stonewall Jackson represents your values, then you don't even need to have this conversation. But I'm guessing because you're having it, it's because not all of you agree that he represents your values. And we know what reasons those are. So who does represent your values? Why don't you come together? You know what they decided? They couldn't decide. They had all these other people. We had women heroes and, and, and men heroes who were people of color. We had LGBT people. They went all over the place looking, but they couldn't get uh, like a parliamentary majority. And so what did they do? They now named it after the street. It's the Mockingbird Elementary School, <laughs> which actually I kind of like because, because it's, it, it, Mockingbird Street is a major street in, in North Dallas, and it's kind of a cool street. I mean, people like Mockingbird, the neighborhoods, the areas, because it goes through a lot of different neighborhoods and stuff, running east and west. And uh, all the parents seem like, yeah, I think that's the best thing to do. Just call it, you know, where are the Mockingbird school? And I thought, okay, you know, uh, I don't have a, a dog in that hunt, as they say. It's like, you guys came together, you want to get rid of the name, now you're Mockingbird. And that's, that's what I think has to happen. You know, communities have to have their own d identities. I mean, I mentioned regional identities like the South, the Midwest, and New England. But I mean, come on, neighborhoods? I live in a neighborhood in Madrid. Barrio de las Letras, and it has an identity, and it is not a quiet suburban one. It is the loudest, in many ways, the most lively place I've ever lived in, except in the most intense parts of New York or other places. And it's just what that barrio is all about. If you don't like it, you won't live there. I mean, I wanted to live there. Um, it reflects who I am right now. <laughs> Maybe some other day I'll want to live out, you know, in the, in, in, in the, in the northern or southern suburbs. But um, communities have a right to decide these things. And t I guess this is not a very good response to your statement. But um, uh, there's nothing like a good controversy to clarify, hmm. you know, what your values are. To begin the conversation. Yeah. It's the beginning. Yeah. My concern is that sometimes it's the beginning and the end. And I think that's where communities go wrong. And that's where the controversy can sometimes just fall flat and we die immediately uh, because once you move to that, but you don't actually have a sustained community conversation. You don't put it in your museum and you say, you know, let's let's talk about narratives here and put this in conversation <coughs> with resistance, with successful resistance. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. And complicate the stories rather than reduce them, make it reductive, good, bad, you know, evil, uh, uh, you know, uh, memorable. Thank you so much, um, all of you, for being here. And thank you, Neil. Um, you gave us a lot to reflect on, I think.